list, like a blacklist of different Bitcoin addresses too. I mean, that's, it, it's just kind of funny. I mean, <laughs> you can't, you can't really blacklist an address. Like that address can send Bitcoin. The, the Bitcoin protocol doesn't recognize that censorship. Um, it, I find it almost comical, you know, but it's, it's interesting to see how, um, you know, how these governments react and just try to, they still don't really get it. That there's not, you can't really control this thing. No, absolutely not. But again, like it's an educational moment. Um, and I guess to some degree, you know, we've seen law enforcement be able to get a hold of Bitcoin. A lot of that requires, you know, real police work um, and in, in apprehending the suspects. You know, a lot of people have talked about the Bitfinex hack that or hackers that were apprehended um, earlier this month. Um, and how most likely, you know, they were apprehended and in custody and then gave up the keys. Uh, again, that's just a theory that has not been confirmed, but it just really makes the cost a lot higher because now you can't just flick of a switch, freeze your bank account. You actually have to go out and get the keys. Uh, and it's just a completely different scenario. Totally. I mean, the, the ability to exercise force or violent force and coercion over a population becomes increasingly difficult when... You know, you've got a, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, wrench attacks and Jameson, of course, here, who we brought up on stage is uh, probably the number one person in the world to talk about Bitcoin security. Uh, his company, Casa, does a fantastic job helping Bitcoiners secure their coin. And he's, he's written some great content on different attack vectors. But what's funny is even in the wrench attack model, you still have to go door to door and wrench attack people as a, as a nation state. And that's just not, it's just not as feasible. And also... You know, if you do that enough times, eventually people might overthrow the state, right? So, you know, there's only so much tolerance that the population might have for something like that. And that's where I think that it's really interesting to see how, like, how do governments reconcile the fact that they are losing control, but then they can't show that they're losing control. Um, it's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think cost is really the most important thing here, where we... We say stuff like, oh, it's nation state resistant. And then the, the haters will come and say, well, you're not going to be saying that once your house is surrounded by men with guns or whatever. But this, I believe, is you know, one of the things that really opened my eyes with my own uh, law enforcement and sort of justice system experience over the past few years even as I was doing a lot of the heavy lifting of investigating my own case uh, where someone had attacked me and handing over a lot of data to the FBI, um, it's very hard for them to justify putting actual human investigations and, and hours and, and time into these things if it's not either a life and death situation or an absurd amount of of money that is is being uh, stolen from someone or, or you know causing financial harm so you know if we're talking about like the situation now with raising money for truckers i i i really don't see quote unquote boots on the ground being deployed for something that's you know, in the hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, like that's just that's a drop in the bucket when when someone in the, the law enforcement system is going to be trying to prioritize their cases. Now, if we're talking about hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, then you can bet that a lot of, of government resources are going to be put on the case. I'm going to disagree with that very briefly, um, because the difference between the trucker situation and your average every day. So if someone gets $50,000 in Bitcoin stolen and absent some, you know, totally freak circumstance where you happen to know who the person is who stole it, the likelihood is it's never coming back with the political crimes. However, compare, for example, the riots that occurred in major American cities in 2020, and then the heavy lift that occurred after January 6, where you had literally hundreds and thousands of people, right. Who were captured within, uh, government legal process to examine that. So my guess is that there's going to probably be some outsized Canadian law enforcement work um, focusing on the trucker protest in the United States. My guess is that the effort will be zero because funding a trucker protest is protected speech under the First Amendment. Um, so, you know, tough. <laughs> but um, but in, on the Canadian side, at least, I'm guessing that they're going to have 
substantial investigative resources, which are going to be taken away from other projects to focus on this in particular. Yeah, I mean, uh, it'll be very interesting to see uh, how things play out. Um, you know, I'm not a lawyer, so uh, very difficult for me to comment on um, how legal what is happening in Canada is and how much footing there is. Uh, I guess in the next few weeks, it's going to really pan out and see if Trudeau is going to be able to get away with the uh, emergency powers at all. But um, it is really shocking to see, you know, how quickly, again, like a G7 nation that's supposed to rank as super high in democracy, um, you know, really uh, just completely <laughs> told these truckers that they're terrorists and that, you know, what they're doing is completely unacceptable and illegal activity. Uh, it, it really just justifies, again, like, how flimsy these guarantees of like top democracies really mean. You know, it's, I'm not a Canadian lawyer, but I am actually an American lawyer and an English lawyer. So, you know, I, I like to think that because Canada is sandwiched between the two, I can actually speak somewhat intelligently on it. Canada follows a weird system. Uh, the, it call, follows the English parliamentary system where the sort of the core of sovereignty is known as the queen in parliament. Right. And what that basically means is that if the parliament, the legislature says something there's really no other rule or no other law or no other constraint on its power, right? Its power can basically be absolute. So in England, the way that they formulate that is they say, if the Queen in Parliament says it's illegal to smoke on the streets of Paris, right, then it's illegal to smoke on the streets of Paris. Of course, those of us familiar with English history, right, they've had you know, longstanding rivals with the French. They've had lots of wars. You know, the French run Paris. But the legal principle, right, as long as as far as they're concerned, is that if Parliament says it, that's the rule as far as the law is aware. So in Canada, they have um, a constant. They have two things. They have this you know, Civil Emergencies Act, which is basically a, and England has something very similar, which basically says that the executive can do whatever the hell it wants on a temporary basis to deal with an extreme emergency situation, suspend civil liberties, do, you know, do all this financial surveillance, whatever. And they also have this thing called the Charter of Rights and Freedoms against which their laws and the exercise of those laws is supposed to be balanced. But because they don't actually have a constitution like the U.S. does, which has sort of strong enforcement mechanisms via Supreme Court and Parliament really calls the shots at the end of the day, they don't have the same kind of robust civil liberties protections that we have here. So it's been challenged, right? So there's the Canadian, the Canadian equivalent of the ACLU has basically said, listen, this, is a, this was not a, a legitimate exercise of the Emergencies Act. You should have just gone in and arrested the truckers. And from a legal standpoint, I'm wondering, this, these are traffic offenses that these people are committing, right? If you park your car in the street and you get out of your car and you, and you throw the keys into the, sand, you know, into, into the snow, you've committed a traffic offense and you should be towed. So either, one, either for whatever reason, the police didn't want to do it or they couldn't get the tow trucks to do it, but they had to do something because for whatever reason, state capacity ceased to exist for carrying out traffic arrests. But I'm not sure that that's a, a justification uh, for, um, you know, for basically committing mass uh, financial surveillance and stealing money from people. But apparently the Canadian government thinks it is. And, um, you know, it'll it'll to be seen, you know, what the long term results are in the Canadian courts. I think from a from a standpoint of everywhere else, though, uh, the importance for us, right, is to self custody is super, super important. Uh, using decentralized methods of communication, using encryption, also super important, um, because we've seen, right, that if there's a protest that the government really, really doesn't like, I've, I've never seen anything like this, and I've never heard of anything like this happening in a Western country ever, period. Um, so we have to start really leveling up our game as Bitcoiners, right, as people in crypto, because if we don't, right, then we're going to wake up one day and we might find that we are persona non grata and that we've lost access to our bank accounts simply because of who we are, the industry we operate in, anything else. Um, so, yeah, we've got to we've got to up our game. We've got to start using tools that allow us to interact with the Bitcoin network directly. And, uh, yeah, we need to start adopting different habits because the Canadian government has shown just how far uh, a neoliberal state is willing to go if you piss them off. Well, it's it's a matter of choke points, I think. And and. I've been talking to a few Canadian friends trying to better understand the situation. And uh, the way that it was explained to me was that you know, using military power is not really even an option for Trudeau and that the military has essentially said that you know, they don't want to go in and, and be hauling people off uh, on behalf 
of him because he is upset about these traffic infractions, as you were saying. And I think that, well, civil disobedience in general is, it's a matter of leveraging numbers, right? And it's the fact that when it comes down to the numbers game, the, the state is actually tiny in comparison to the population at large. Now, of course, for a variety of different reasons, states amass large amounts of power in a variety of different ways. But I think what we're seeing here is that uh, you know Trudeau has not been able to compel either police or tow truck drivers to get what he wants done and may not be able even to compel military to do that. So he's falling back to the other tools that are available. And it just so happens the financial system has been architected in such a way that there's a very small number of choke points that are a lot easier to compel. Yeah. Just thinking about it from a, I think Jameson brought up a great point. It's a raw numbers game, right? Like how many, how many active military are there? And in, in, for example, in my frame of reference, the United States versus the total population, it's gotta be less than gotta be maybe, maybe max 1%, maybe like 4 million active military. Men. I'm just throwing a number out there. I don't, I could Google it here in a second, but that's just off the top of my head. Um, and then you look at police and it's probably that number or smaller. And so it's actually, yeah, I mean, the, the people far outnumber the, the enforcement of the state. Um, there's just the state, you know, just believes that most people in mass wouldn't protest. Um, but yeah, it's, it's in these moments, though, where the, the marketing message of Bitcoin is so hard to get across sometimes. A lot of us who've been around for a while, I mean, Jameson, you've been around for forever and same with, the, and same with a lot of others on this call. Um, you know, we, we would tell people, hey, by the way, you know, you should you should do self-custody. You know, get a, uh, get a ledger, get a treasure, go get a cold card, go go do your own self-custody. And people would go, well, why? You know, I trust my state. And it's only in these moments when people start to wake up and go, wait a second, maybe, maybe this is the time I shouldn't trust the state. And um, I'm just thankful that there are moments like these where people can – can come to the side of Bitcoin and realize like, okay, I, maybe it's time to get my cold storage set up because it's, it's hard to convince people otherwise, like, Hey, you need to do this. Cause they're, cause they're like, Oh, I live in the UK or the U S we have great, we have great laws and great values. And, and if they, if they don't see these little moments that could, they could be stuck in a moment when they really need it. And the government is really cracking down and they haven't done this stuff preemptively. That's a really good point. By the time you need it, it's already too late if you don't already have it. So that's one for owning Bitcoin, but two, definitely self-custody. So you're not going to be warned that uh, you won't be able to withdraw or you won't be able to send to this address or you will have to go through additional steps in order to get your coin. So, I, you know, I wouldn't hesitate and I would definitely consider um, all the different options for, you know, how to most securely hold your funds and respect the future value of those sets. I think there is a last mile problem, though. I don't know if this has been discussed, but um, while the the Canadian decree of you know, blocking all financial institutions from interacting with any funds that have been shown to be a part of this fundraise effort is kind of comical, it's, it's also, it's true in, in the sense that you know, if someone sends those funds to an exchange, they probably have the ability to tell that they're within so many hops. And, you know, even if they're mixed, uh, you know, in many cases, exchanges will say, oh, you, you mix the funds. We think it's too risky to deal with you. So there, there does still seem to be a last mile problem of, you know, if you want to use Bitcoin as a censorship resistant payment rail to get money to political dissidents or or anyone who is otherwise being blocked from the traditional financial system, you can't just expect them to then go take that Bitcoin and use a, a exchange that is really part of the traditional financial system because they may end up back in the same boat. 100%. And that's where ultimately at some point, enough people have to actually demand Bitcoin for there to be a circular enough economy that we can get around that. Uh, it's still, I think in, in my mind has, has shown an enormous amount of progress and promise. And I'm kind of curious what, what Dan or Preston think of that. Are you talking the circular economy or? Circular economy or even just yeah, like what, the last mile have? problem that, that Jameson described. So, yeah, well, go ahead, Dan. Go, go ahead, Preston. 
I mean, one thing that I have seen a lot of uh, is that we're seeing a lot of websites uh, primarily based in the United States, which are aimed at providing services principally to conservatives. However, um, you know, that's just basically they're, they're approaching the, the they're approaching banking, they're approaching payment processing and they're approaching um, uh, social networking communications from the perspective of free speech, freedom to transact and various other things. A lot of the pressure that gets put on uh, financial institutions and the like to debank people is informal, right? So what will happen is you'll get a bank examiner. They'll come in and they'll say, you know, that guy's kind of risky. Maybe you want to get rid of him, right? And so sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. If the customer is super duper risky, then like what they'll do is they'll go up. They'll either, you know, they'll boot the bank out of the, out of the banking system by removing their correspondent banking relationship, right? So if something's super, super dangerous and for whatever reason doesn't pass muster for like KYC reasons or you know, or, or counterterrorism financing, then a bank can potentially lose its license. But for mere political stuff, um, they basically go in, they give an informal nudge and say, we don't like this guy. You might not want to do that. I have a client who's been debanked multiple times in the last 24 months because it's politically controversial. So that's like, you know, that's, that's the kind of stuff that you see on a, on a pretty regular basis. Now, there are services that exist, and there are new banks that are coming out into existence, and there are crypto banks coming into existence. There are all kinds of entities which are going, or which aim to basically serve this market segment. So if you're a bank, just a normal mom and pop bank or some you know, high street bank, and you have a controversial customer, that's potentially a risk to your business because it's a controversial customer and you might get people removing deposits. If, however, you cater to those controversial customers and you say, you know what, this is our core uh, market segment, then all of a sudden they're not so risky anymore, right? That's your, it's your USP, that's your business. So it's, it makes a very different argument if someone comes in and says, well, you're risky because you bank conservatives and you go, well, listen, my, my whole thing is that I bank anybody, right, regardless of what their political orientation is. So it's not that much of a risk to us. So we're starting to see those kinds of services emerge. It's, it's ranging all the way from hosting at the base level. We're seeing you know, free speech hosting providers. We're seeing free speech. Uh, what's it called? I can't remember. But there's a, there's a live streaming provider. I can't remember exactly what it's called. You've got multiple versions of free speech YouTube. You've got Gab TV, Odyssey, uh, Rumble. So there are a whole bunch of them. And at least in you know, the ones I know and the CEOs I know, they're all based Bitcoin or libertarians who are running these businesses. So I think part of that problem is going to be fixed as people build these censorship resistant businesses, businesses that basically have a CEO at the top that's willing to draw a line and say, you know what, listen, we get that there's informal pressure to debank this person, to kick them off social media. Um, this is the United States, the First Amendment, you know, rules the roost, and therefore we're drawing a line at that, and we're not going to do it. So that's an important part of it, is that you have the services which match the ethos of Bitcoin, where people, you know, at the absolute worst case scenario, they get debanked, whatever else, they can go make a living, they can go broadcast content, they can go speak to the world, uh, they can go host, get their content hosted. So that, that's an important piece of it. And it really hasn't existed except for the last 12 months. And I think over the next sort of 24, 36 months, we're going to see, and you can see it if you go on the Alexa uh, rankings for sort of like Gab Parlor, Rumble, who else? Odyssey's up there, uh, Getter. And you look at their rankings, right, and what they've done in the last 12 months. It's unbelievable where they've come from and where they currently are. Um, so, so I would expect that we're going to see that just eventually there's going to be a preference cascade where people realize, Hey, hold on a second. Other people I know are using these services. I better start using it too. And that'll probably be in the next 12 months. So th that's a big part of the problem. But do you think this is something where the United States will essentially be able to export freedom to the world? Like in the sense that these, uh, based banks, uh, will, Will they be able to provide, you know, services to people in less free countries? The banks won't, but the tech companies will. So if you're running an internet company in the United States and you want to service users in Russia and Russia says, guess what? It's illegal for you to service these users in Russia because, you know, a First Amendment protected activity that these users are, are engaging in on your website. You've got a First Amendment right to host them and they've got a First Amendment right to be there, even though they're in Russia and they're accessing your servers remotely from Russia. So what will wind up happening is we're going to, these companies will basically be open to the world. And if the world wants to regulate them, it's the, the world's going to have to block them at the ISP level from the entire country. So they'll still be accessible by Tor or other services. But the existence of tech providers in the U.S. that follow U.S. rules 
does serve to export American rules and norms to countries that aren't willing to block uh, U.S. companies and businesses at the ISP level. Yo, what is going on, plebs? We're going to take a break from our programming to tell you about the resurrection of our print magazine, starting with the El Salvador issue. Starting this fall, Bitcoin Magazine will be available on newsstands nationwide and at retail stores such as Barnes & Noble. Don't want to get off your couch, though? No problem. You can also go to store.bitcoinmagazine.com. So skip the line and get each issue shipped directly to your front door with our annual subscription. I'm talking four issues a year that contain exclusive interviews and profiles with leading Bitcoiners, actionable insights on the state of the market, breaking news and cultural trends, along with powerful photos and artwork from the best artists in the world. Subscribe today and get 21% off using code podcast at checkout. That's P-O-D-C-A-S-T, podcast at checkout. I think that uh, it's, been, it's been kind of annoying um, to see companies like Gitter and others advertise no censorship, but they don't have the infrastructure to actually enable that. It's more of like just trust. <laughs> trust us that we won't, that we'll stand by those principles. And I find, I find that particularly annoying. I would be curious to hear if you guys have like uh, some other instances that you've seen of this where they're literally saying trust, don't verify versus like relying on, um, you know, cryptographic trust or some sort of mechanisms in which we could remove control. They're simply saying, well, we're the, we're a right wing social platform or whatever you want to call it, or we're, we're a libertarian social platform and we are built exactly with the same tech stack as these other platforms are, but we just won't censor you. There's, there's a problem with that from a legal, there is a legal problem with that. The legal problem is, is that if you have unlawful pornography on your website, you have an obligation to remove it. Or if you have a link to it, you have an obligation to remove it and file a mandatory report with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. So the idea that you'll ever have a social media website that that operates on a completely decentralized basis, um, where someone is hosting the stuff and they they you know expressly disclaim the right or power to remove it, uh, is pie in the sky. It'll never happen. And if someone does it and and proceeds on that basis, they'll go to jail. So I, I think we can we can write that off. What's interesting is I'm starting to see, and I'm not going to name names, but there are two people who are one guy's pretty well known in Bitcoin, um, the other guy's not so well known. But there are people who are starting to figure out that you can do client side stuff where you can basically pull, um, you can use the, like a blockchain, like Ethereum, as sort of a, a backbone, right? Or a DNS, where you can then go and point to other people's servers, which they're running locally, pull content back you know, to your computer, and then see it on your computer. So it's kind of like Mastodon, except instead of running you know, someone else's server, everybody is running their own server, right? As opposed to some third party running a server, which has its own rules. So then you just decide which servers you're going to plug into, which people you're going to talk to, and you talk to them directly peer to peer. So that's a potential next step is that sort of the blockchain and crypto universe acts as a kind of giant directory or DNS, which allows all of these peer to peer services to connect to one another and people just run it all locally on their machines. I mean, so if you follow 100 people on Twitter, you know, the amount of data that you're going to have is not going to be like 500 gigabytes on your machine uh, if you follow them for a year, unless they're producing like tons and tons and tons of media content. Yeah, it would just be, it would just be with like really like graphically intensive social media platforms like YouTube or Instagram. Yeah, that, and that stuff, I think, when you're dealing with the scale of those platforms, like petabytes per minute, um, it just doesn't make sense to make any of that decentralized. Um, so I think what, what we have seen is that there's been some bifurcation in the market between platforms that do censor more heavily and platforms that censor less heavily. So Getter is known for censoring somewhat heavily. They banned a bunch of the Groiper crowd right off the bat. And the reason they did that is obvious. It's because they've got an app store dependency. Um, I actually have a, a, <laughs> I have a Truth Social app on a test flight. I'm pl playing with that now. And they have an app store dependency too. And so Apple and Google, if you're dependent on those app stores for distribution, then you're going to play by their rules. And that means you're going to do AI, you know, AI driven uh, content moderation. You're going to be super aggressive. You're going to take hard right influencers off your website. And so they develop a reputation for that. But, you know, Grandpa Boomer, right, who wants to post pictures of him duck hunting or something and, and follow Donald Trump can do that all day. And it's just not going to be a problem. Um, so that's one segment of the market. But then you have the other segment of the market, which is sort of like a bit shoot or an odyssey, I think, versus a rumble. 
So a Rumble is a, is a YouTube. Com- These are all YouTube competitors. Rumble tends to be a little more conventional. Um, Odyssey is a little more on the libertarian side because it's run by Jeremy Kaufman, who's who's like basically the head of the Free State Project and running for Senate in New Hampshire is libertarian. So no surprise that his company is libertarian. And then you've got BitChute, which is like anything goes like we don't care <laughs> like how much of a Nazi you are. We're not going to take it down. And if you go to BitChute, like they have had trouble for years getting payment processing as a consequence of this. I think they're also based in England. They're not based in the U.S. But despite this, they've had a pretty lax moderation policy. And so if you want to go get extreme content, go to BitChute and you'll find it. Um, so different people congregate in different sectors, different segments of the market. And each site gets their own reputation um, you know, for being uh, this way or that way about moderation. And then people pick and they say, OK, well, I want that one because its content moderation is enough and I don't want to see you know, there are people who go to Gab and they say they love it. And there are people who go to Gab and say it's awful. And it's full of Nazis. I'd rather go to Parler or I'd rather go to Getter. Um, so different strokes for different folks. And I think we're going to see a, a fragment yeah. market continue. Yeah, it, I definitely see the fragmentation being kind of like more politically oriented rather than any sort of like actual like tech stack oriented. Yeah. So Truth Social is based on so Truth Social and Gab are based on Mastodon. Um, which is interesting. So ma- weirdly, because Mastodon, Mastodon is like a total fucking, pardon my French, but it's a trash fire to use. So they've cleaned it up <laughs> quite a bit, uh, but the back end is still Mastodon, which is GPL. So I think we're probably going to see a lot more Mastodon forks uh, in the future. I don't know what Getter runs on, but I'm pretty sure it doesn't run on Mastodon. Um, I know Parler. I don't think they run on Mastodon. I don't think uh, they're licensed. I, I can't remember that they've um, they've said that. So, so yeah, there's, there's a variety of different approaches on the tech stack front. Mastodon is generally a prime suspect because it's so easy to fork. And you've also got existing forks of Mastodon, which have been heavily modified to make it prettier and easier to use. So from that standpoint, uh, I think we'll probably see quite a bit more of that. Um, yeah, you know, TBD, what, what that actually turns out to be. I find the whole Mastodon forking stuff to be kind of amusing because... I actually run my own Mastodon node now. I've uh, been doing that for a few months and have spoken to some other Mastodon node operators. Uh, you know, NVK uh, runs the Bitcoin Hackers yep. Mastodon node. And um, from a tech standpoint, it's a complete trash fire. Uh, like, it's it's a Ruby on Rails app that it just does not scale well. So I like. I'll be interested to see if, if Truth Social and some of these others like actually scale to millions and millions of users, and if so, if we could figure out like how they actually did that. The um, truth, truth <laughs> even now in dev, like with 200 users, Truth's still pretty. It's a little clunky, and it's clunky in the way. And anyone who's used like a Mastodon mobile app, it's clunky in only a way that we will know and you know be aware of and love. So like it's a, it's a clunky, non-federated Mastodon app. And when they launch it, like, I don't care how many AWS instances they have, you know, ready to roll when they finally get, get it out of beta, they're going to get absolutely crushed. Um, and like nothing is going to work for like a week because there's just going to be so much inbound. And I don't think Mastodon can handle it. So it's, it'll be very interesting to see. I think you're right. I think Mastodon is a total. It's a mess. And the other problem is, A, it's a mess. B, it's, you have to modify it very heavily to make it useful. And C, Eugen Rochko, the guy who wrote it, uh, is in the habit of sending out GPL3 enforcement letters to people who fork his code, right? So usually if you do GPL, like so a GPL license, for those of us who are not um, software licensing people, if you open source licenses allow you to use someone else's software in certain terms, one of them is called the GPL. It's called the copyleft license. And what that means is that if you take someone's code, it's GPL, and, or AGPL, excuse me, and you build a new application, right? So let's say I take Mastodon and I make Prestodon, right? This is my social network, Prestodon network. You know, I'm a giant elephant and come, to, come on it and talk about marmots. It'll be great. So I start that and I don't then open source my modifications to their code. I'm in violation of the license, which means that the original license holder, the guy who wrote the Mastodon software, can enforce a copyright infring- or can bring a copyright infringement action against me if he's registered his copyright with the copyright office. So you basically you have to republish all of your code. That can be annoying if, for example, you're trying to make changes which are proprietary or you don't want people who are trying to hack your website to see what's going on in the back end. So and and if and if you're getting licensed demands from the guy who actually <laughs> founded the software. So I think that that, um, that attitude is super aggressive. It's not uh, and it's not going to survive. 
uh, because you can't you can't have a software project where even if it is GPL, like you don't want to be getting demand letters because your implementation or, or your you know your your republication was somehow deficient or imperfect from the from the standpoint of the GPL license of the original author. Um, it's just, it's just like suing people is not a good way to get them to use your software. And they did that to Truth Social, so they went after Truth Social for that. Yeah, I wish that more people would be active on Mastodon. Unfortunately, at least from a like Bitcoin Mastodon space, I I only see a handful of people who have like really migrated there, and probably ninety five percent of the stuff in my timeline is people that are just mirroring their Twitter posts. And if you respond to them, they probably won't even see it and reply back. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, from a user experience perspective, users are going to flock to the social media tool that has the easiest to use interface and has a network effect. And it, I find it pretty humorous in like the Web3 arena and stuff where like, you know, people talk about community communities and the ability to, you know, rebuild community. And I'm like, community is really tough to build. It's really hard to create network effects. And there's a reason why Facebook and Twitter are still around. Um and also, it's really hard to keep a social network fun and exciting and useful for people. Like, we all complain about how little Twitter has done over the years, but they're probably doing a lot of back-end stuff in terms of fixing things and optimizing things. And there's a lot of stuff I don't like about Twitter, by the way. But working at a big tech company, I've worked at Uber and then at Kraken, you realize, like, these things require huge, huge amounts of infrastructure. And just to make it usable, just to make it semi-usable, um, and people think that, you know, Web3 world or like, these, you know, Mastodon or Gitter, you know, can be, can usurp these existing social media platforms, I just find very unrealistic. Well, yeah, I mean, if it, if you've been on Twitter for a decade, then you probably remember the fail whale. And the fail whale has, has pretty much gone extinct. I mean, Twitter does still go down once in a blue moon, but they have definitely managed uh, the scalability issues quite well. Uh, whereas on the other hand, even like my own Mastodon node is sometimes unresponsive and Mastodon is not exactly a, a huge high throughput network. So I guess with, with all the challenges of running your own hardware, are, is anyone here bullish on the idea of people running their own hardware beyond, you know, simply running a Bitcoin node, uh, doing something a little bit more complex, like social networking or something along those lines 100 percent, it's going to happen and it's going to basically people will be the people who are developing the protocols are going to build boxes that accompany the protocols they're going to sell we're starting to see that now with some of the like funkier new like wi-fi monetization protocols or like uh, helium with its LoRaWAN. they're selling these you know miners in a box and i'm not saying that that's necessarily the, the way forward right and i'm not necessarily endorsing that project but what I am saying is you're going to have dedicated hardware that you can run at home, plug in, totally idiot proof, hook in your node, use it for something, leave it on, earn money in a shit coin from having it running. And then that's that. So you're going to be a participant in the network. You're going to be compensated for running part of the network. And you're going to have some hardware in your house and you're going to, up, you're going to upgrade it every couple of years. So I think, I think that's totally feasible. I think it's absolutely going to happen. I think we're already seeing it with like Bitcoin, you know, if you run a Bitcoin full node, there's all sorts of like, um, you know, like get Umbral and these other uh, software tools, these OSs are, are able to like really create like an, an app store. And I think that's, you know, if I were to guess what Umbral's VC pitch is to like their investors is that, yeah, we start with running a Bitcoin full node. And then if people are comfortable with doing that, then we can have them do other things to, you know, uh, what they, like host their own email server and some other you know things to reclaim their sovereignty. I'm going to take the dissenting opinion here, unfortunately. <laughs> and I, I really want you know these visions of the future to be true. I really want people to be running plug-and-play, uh, idiot-proof hardware. I, I just don't know if the hardware is really going to be made idiot-proof. And, and the main reason I say that is just because of all of the weird networking and hardware failures that I've seen from uh, basically acting as support agent for people running plug and play boxes at home. Uh, we were astounded by all of the weird edge cases that showed up. 
And, you know, maybe it is really only a matter of time until all of those rough edges get rounded off and, and we really can have something that is idiot proof, but there's just so many things that can go wrong. And the average person is, you know, not technical and not capable of debugging stuff. And I don't know, my, my own experience is just like with, with even with playing tech support for my own parents with just their like modem and router at home and all of the times that they essentially get blocked out of their own internet connection and aren't able to troubleshoot it. Um, I feel like we're at the very least, we're a long ways away from that point. And so in, in the short to medium term, I'm more bearish than bullish, but I, I really do want to see that future happen. Do you think that the censorship that we're seeing on platforms like Twitter is going to expedite that or expedite that? Or uh, do you think, you know, people are just going to go to these, uh, the censorship, or sorry, the centralized, but, you know, right winged, uh, branded social media platforms? Twitter is built. the path of least resistance. I mean, people will always take the, the path of least resistance. And that's why I think it's far more likely that people end up essentially platform hopping from one centralized service to another, uh, rather than going deeper and, and looking at things like censorship resistance. I mean, that's such a, a much more abstract concept for people to grasp. Uh, I, I, I'm, I don't hold out a lot of hope uh, for, for people to like understand what the fundamental issues are that are at play. Uh, and so unfortunately, and, and I think Dan agrees with this, is that uh, usability is what drives uh, really growth and user capture more than uh, these more abstract concepts. And so you know, Bitcoin is doing well for, for many different reasons, and it's great for us to, to see some of these adversarial situations pop up that we can point to since, you know, most of the time people will just lash out and, and say, you know, you're, you're being paranoid. These things are never going to happen to me. And it's, it's nice to be able to point out some real world examples, but it, it, it's a weird double-edged sword of as, as a as a bitcoiner like as an adversarially minded person almost wanting for bad things to happen in the world so that people just wake up and see like why we actually need these tools and why they're valuable and i don't want to be that guy you know i don't want to be the guy who wants people to have to endure pain and suffer from various authorities uh harming them in a number of different ways before they're going to wake up. But on the other hand, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that people, you know, they, they, they're living their lives. They have a million things to be worried about. So unless something terrible happens that, you know, brings this up to the top of their priority list, it's, it's really tough to say uh, exactly what is going to capture people's interest and allow them to see the value in one system over another. One thing I, I will note, on this is that this is we haven't we haven't seen really a Sears Roebuck type of situation where you've got some giant which is assumed to be perpetual and you know, everlasting uh, getting really outrun by a competitor. So for the last couple of years, the biggest social has been Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, right? So and and now TikTok is like a, a major competitor, but it didn't dethrone any of the old guys because it really wasn't offering the same thing. It was offering some fundamentally different service. So one thing I saw, I read an article in the Atlantic the other day, which uh, cited a study which said that on Facebook in the United States, 30% of all content is created by 1% of the users. And then 56% of all content is created by 30% or sorry, 56% of the content is created by 3% of the users. So, and that's the engagement, right? That's the thing that keeps these platforms alive. The thing that keeps them the clicking is not your picture of your cat or your dog, which four people like. It's posting some crazy woke shit that you know gets tons of people you know yelling at each other and then clicking on ads for ammunition. I don't know in the sidebar or something. I don't use Facebook anymore, so I don't know what they're advertising for. But that's what gets Facebook money is that kind of engagement. Now, as they've censored, right? We've started to see. So Facebook had an absolute drop uh, last quarter, which is why they, their share price fell twenty five percent. So they had an absolute drop in the number of daily active users for the first time in their history, right? Which, so they have, they have plateaued and they have started to shrink. 
And in particular, they're shrinking quickly in places like the United States and the United Kingdom. And the target, you know, the, the sort of key demographic that is generating that one or three percent are a bunch of bored white guys. So basically, it's old white dudes posting on nobody is around who's under 30. Everybody who's generating all their content is over 30. And they're white guys, which tend to trend sort of they skew Republican and conservative. And there's a whole slew of new offerings which are now targeting that user base and saying, hey, you have your silly opinions. Like, come on to our website, say them over here. We're not going to censor you. We're not going to boot you off. So it, I think that it could happen. So it, the changes here could happen much more quickly than I think any of us realizes, particularly if you think, OK, Facebook's got, you know, 250, 300 million. Let's say it's 250 million users in the U.S. So half of those 125 are men. Right. And then maybe, I don't know, one, two, three million are responsible for generating the vast majority of Facebook's content. So if those 3 million people move, all of a sudden Facebook's lost 30% of its engagement and you could see a very rapid shift in the, in the patterns of you know, how these websites are used and where this sort of conversation, you know, the zeitgeist happens. I, don't th I think Facebook is the zeitgeist is very yesterday's news. Twitter is the zeitgeist is driven by journalists, but there's eventually gonna be another center for that. And it'll be really interesting to see which one it is. And I think, I think they're, they're sowing the seeds of their own destruction. Yeah, this is a really cool narrative path where um, a lot of people don't think about social media as like a two-sided marketplace of content creators and then content like consumers. And a lot of people just go on social media and they're like, oh, I like content. Well, there's only so many people who want to spend the time to be a content creator. Basically, a content creator, in my definition here, is someone who's spending the time to put out content every day, which is actually like a pretty hard job to do. And so what happens is, you know, for example, if a huge chunk of content creators leave, then the content consumers who drive a lot of that engagement, aka ad revenue, they disappear as well. So it, it is indeed a two-sided marketplace. And we also see this happen in trading, in liquidity. So with liquidity, you need buyers and sellers for any market, right? So you look at order books and you look at the health of the order books and you look at the liquidity of an exchange based on a lot of different factors, one of those being or a lot of people wanting to buy and sell. And, and same thing with content. Are there a lot of people wanting to create and consume content? And the content creators want an incentive to create content. They want to, they want to grow their audience. They want better tools to create cooler content. And if you don't satisfy them, you won't get the content consumers. But if you don't have the content consumers, then you don't have the content creators because why would a creator create content for a, an audience that is non-existent? So it's actually a really tricky uh, uh, problem in terms of like a marketplace problem. And so, yeah, I think that, you know, it's really tricky to, you know, to get that back. And if indeed Facebook is losing part of its network effect, some of its marketplace effect there with content consumers and creators, then it's going to have a really hard time because that could devolve not in an elegant fashion, but in a, in a very intense fashion. In fact, there's a couple of good examples with like trading liquidity, where if you look at, um, remember Bit Bitrix and Phonyx? <laughs> you know, I mean, those are two exchanges that were very, very, um, those were big popular exchanges in the 2017 era. And almost, I've never heard anyone name drop them in the last two years. So, you know, I think that, and if you look at their liquidity and their volume, it, it has dropped dramatically. Um, so liquidity and, and network effect with, you know, content creators and consumers is really delicate. So I 100% agree with Preston. Like, we could see it devolve very rapidly. Um, but granted, Facebook can pay some of the smartest people in the world to figure out how to keep you there. And, you know, if I've, you know, I've worked in a variety of different marketing roles, product marketing being one of them, product marketing would try to figure out ways to reduce the churn in the product. So them and the PMs would sit down and go, well, we're looking at these different cohorts and these different customer segments. And we're seeing them all start to churn. How do we keep them from churning? What, what new features do we need to release? And when you look at Facebook stories, it's sort of the same thing. It's like they created Instagram stories to try to fight, um, you know, what was going on with Snapchat. And Facebook also adopted that too, which was super bizarre because it's like kind of shoehorning in like a new user function that doesn't really fit Facebook's vibe. But you could see this happening a long time ago. You could see the downtrend in the, in, the, in the shift of like millennials to Instagram and the younger Gen Z folks going over to Snapchat. So this is sort of like, you know, we're finally seeing some of that rise to the surface and sort of, sort of seeing that Dow, that Dow miss the daily active user hit that Facebook took. But yeah, I uh, want to wrap up with saying, you know, agree with Preston here that I totally agree that you could see this devolve pretty quickly. My fellow plebs, the Bitcoin conference is back. 
Bitcoin 2022, April 6th through the 9th is the ultimate pilgrimage for the Bitcoin ecosystem. The Bitcoin conference is the biggest event in all of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. We're leveling up and making this bigger and better than ever. I'm talking straight to the moon with the four day long festival in the heart of Miami at the Miami Beach Convention Center. This has something for everyone. Whether you're a high-powered Bitcoin entrepreneur, a core developer, or a Bitcoin newbie, Bitcoin 2022 is the ultimate place for you to be with your people and celebrate and learn about the Bitcoin culture. So make sure to go to b.tc forward slash conference to lock in your official tickets and use promo code Satoshi for 10% off. Want more off? Pay in Bitcoin and you'll receive $100 off general admission and $1,000 off whale pass. Those are stackable. So go to b.tc forward slash conference and attend the best conference in Bitcoin history. Yo, my fellow Bitcoin lovers, have I got something specifically curated for you. The Deep Dive is Bitcoin Magazine's premium markets intelligence newsletter. This isn't some paid group shilling buy and sell signals. No, this is a premium Bitcoin analysis led by Dylan LeClaire and his team of analysts. They break down in an easily digestible way what is happening on chain, in the derivatives markets, and in the greater macro backdrop context for Bitcoin. This newsletter turns volatility into a joke. So hit up members.bitcoin.magazine.com and use promo code podcast for 30% off the deep dive. That's members.bitcoinmagazine.com, promo code podcast for 30% off. Divorce your pay group and learn why Bitcoin is the strongest asset by Dylan and LeClaire and his team. So uh, I know we had an hour uh, marked out here. I don't know if you have a hard stop here, Dan, but um, we had a couple more topics here kind of around uh, Russia and inflation print. Uh, I don't know if we want to try to hit on those before we wrap it up. Yeah, we've got 10 more minutes. So let's touch on some of those. All right. I mean, I guess uh, you you, uh, you seem to uh, be really on top of what's happening with Russia and it'd be interesting to hear uh, Preston and Jameson's take as well. I guess, do you want to kind of uh, prime the conversation about what's going on yeah. there from your perspective? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so with Russia, you know, Ukraine, it, it's funny how it, when we read U.S. media, we feel so emotionally involved with the Ukrainians. And by the way, some of my closest friends are Ukrainian. The thing is, though, I mean, how close really are you with this country? How How much do you understand their, their history and the geopolitics of the region and everything else. Um, you know, a lot of people felt this way too when the U.S. And, you know, invaded Afghanistan and Iraq, where we're like, we're the liberators, we're the freedom fighters. But we didn't understand the super complex sort of relationship between the different warring factions and the history of the country. Um, and with Ukraine, there's a little bit of that as well. Like, to be clear, Ukraine wants to be free. They want to be independent. Um, however, you know, Russia is seeing the U.S. encroach upon their authority and their control over the region you know, with NATO. Um, I'm not sure exactly why NATO needs to exist post-Cold War. It is actually a pretty interesting question to think about, right? Like, why does this organization exist post-Cold War? Um, the U.S. continues to keep escalating while Russia was declining. Um, there's also some other things that were pretty bizarre as well. For example, like the CIA being involved in various Russian conflicts and the Russians also being involved, like we never heard about the Russians being involved in Afghanistan or Iraq. We only heard about them being involved in like Syria, for example. Um, but, you know, we cross swords in all these different regions. And the last time the Russia got close enough to us that we're as close as we are to them with Ukraine was Cuba. And that almost started a war. So what I'm trying to say here, and by the way, I'm not a Russia apologist. I'm not apologizing for Putin. I think he's a terrible person and, and Russia can deserve a much better leader. But, you know, it, we, like pro-Ukraine was a little bit, it felt, you know, orchestrated in some fashion, right? Like this, this is uh, definitely, you know, these chess moves are being played out by the military industrial complex who have great incentives. Um, they have great incentives. Hold on, I think I have an internet issue here. I think the Russians got them. <laughs> yep, this always happens. He wants, uh, he wants to jump in. Preston. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great country. Long long and storied history for the last thousand years. Good poetry. Um, interesting food. Stretches from the Black Sea to the Arctic. 
fascinating culture, wonderful place. We shouldn't be going to war. That's none of our none of our business. I guess kind of turning it over to uh, to what's happening in in Russia. Um, are you familiar with uh, exactly what their moves entail? So I am familiar in a, from a Bitcoin standpoint that they've sort of done a bit of a 180 where they've started to uh, embrace crypto, which is just not at all a surprise, given the fact that the U.S.'s principal weapon uh, in trying to contain them has been cutting them off from the global financial system. So, I mean, it's it doesn't surprise me that that's happening. It'll be really interesting to see. There was a story, I think, the other day that they have something like $200 billion of crypto uh, you know, socked away in a vault somewhere. So that would be pretty interesting if Russia holds 20% of the world's crypto supply and um, the U.S., you know, <laughs> doesn't, uh, despite having had lots of historic Bitcoin seizures. So I think that what, what's happening now, uh, it'll become much more apparent uh, in five or six years, maybe even three to five years, um, what, you know, what role crypto plays in geopolitics. I would not be surprised if the sort of G20 or G7 group decided that it wasn't in their interest to have any crypto whatsoever. And they tried to pull a Canada except on steroids. Right. So I think that what's happening in Canada right now is a bit of a test run and policymakers around the G7 and the G20 are looking at it around the West to see how effective it is, learn lessons from it, that sort of thing. Um, I think Russia. Yeah, I think Russia. We tried to cut them off from the financial system and look what they did. They acquired 20 percent of the world's Bitcoin supply reportedly um, or crypto supply. So I, I think that. Um, that's the lesson for policymakers uh, is that the, the harder you squeeze, the more you're going to push people into it. And I think that they're not taking the lesson. I think they're taking they're drawing exactly the wrong conclusions. They say, ah, look, the RCMP, we drew up a list and we said that you couldn't, you know, couldn't, couldn't deal with uh, Bitcoin from or Monero or ADA or LTC. Shame on whoever donated Cardinal to the truckers. That's not helping them at all. But um, <laughs> so um, but like. They, they think that they've done something, but they've done virtually nothing, right? They've just basically said, okay, cool. Don't, they've signaled to all of the Bitcoin donator, you know, don't, donors saying, listen, don't donate to these addresses. Go find some other way to get your money into the country if you don't want to punish the people who you want to support. So they're, they're, they're a couple steps behind. Um, they really don't understand the battle space. They don't understand what they're regulating. They think that, and you can tell that from some of the statements. They're like, well, we've prohibited you know, financial institutions are dealing in Bitcoin from this address. And it's like, great. So someone could just go take the Bitcoin and go buy a beer with it somewhere. Like you haven't prohibited them from doing it. Um, so, and it's going to be really, really hard to enforce. So from that standpoint, I, I think we're watching the world uh, adopt different approaches. I think Russia's approach is very future oriented. And I think they got pushed there by the policies of the United States. So if that winds up biting the United States in, in the rear end, uh, in the near future, we really don't have anyone to blame other than ourselves. Do you think Vlad went and bought a bunch of F after he talked to Vitalik? I mean, I don't know. You talk to Vitalik. You could talk to, you know, I don't know, some guy that uh, some other dude uh, based in Brooklyn I mean, who he, had a lot of ether. Did, I mean, who knows? He definitely has. I mean, look, they have gold reserves. There's no way that Putin doesn't have some gold and, and fiat stashed away. It'd be crazy if he didn't have some Bitcoin or other crypto stashed away. I mean, that that would be very surprising to me. Especially with, you know, he knows that this probably this game probably isn't going to last forever. Eventually, someone more powerful will oust him. I mean, he only has one life, and so preserving that wealth is is pretty paramount for him. And you can only keep his wealth preserved right now if he's in power. He loses that wealth if he does. Um, in fact, I've watched some documentaries on how he, he's actually probably the wealthiest person in the world, is what people estimate estimate because what he does is he has friends own certain companies, but he owns them. So they don't actually own the company he, or he's a silent partner. And there's like massive shell structures that are set up to obfuscate his holdings. Um, or he has some sort of arrangement with them where he's like, look, in 10 years, I want this company back. And, and then I'd like you to give it back to me. Um, so yeah, the, the wealthiest people, time. the wealthiest people are not on the Forbes 100 list and that's by design, right? Exactly. And so, I think Putin gets the game and probably got the game a long time ago with like, like what the value of Bitcoin could bring him. He's probably seeing now the value that it brings him for his country, where he needs to be able to keep his financial system running. And if the U.S. gets really intense and starts saber rattling and starts to cut them off from various financial infrastructure, then he's like, cool, we'll just, we'll just evolve to the next level. I mean, just imagine what 
what how the world what the world would look like right russia has about 150 million citizens uh, it's a big country it's really only three cities um, the two biggest ones are moscow and st petersburg st petersburg is, is a bit of a mess and they don't plow the snow so like it's not like a massive like mega powerhouse like china or india or even the us right however imagine like cast your mind forward five, 10 years. And then all of a sudden Russia has the biggest sovereign wealth holdings of crypto in the world uh, and one fifth of all crypto in existence under its roof. Ima- imagine what the world looks like when that is the case. Like it, it looks completely different, right? All of a sudden Russia is basically Scandinavia with nuclear weapons, which is, a very, which is a very different kettle of fish than what it is now, which is that its population is shrinking and they can't, you know, they can't keep the, the, the roads clear of snow in St. Petersburg. So they, he, they may have, this may be a genius play if in fact they've done it. Um, and the world's going to look really, really different uh, if, if in fact that's what's happened. Yeah, I think it is interesting to think of this from the geopolitical point of view. And I was reading an article recently, I think it was about some ransomware uh, that was, it was purposefully not targeting uh victims in russia it was like if if you were on a russian ip address or a russian email address then like they would they would not uh encrypt your your computer if the ransomware activated on it i forget the specific details but the i think you know we have seen plenty of evidence that north korea for example has uh you know state-funded actors that are going out and and hacking as many crypto custodians as possible and stealing the money and then using that to, to fund various nation state activities. And I don't know that any of the, the Russian hackers or ransomware authors have necessarily been connected directly uh, to Russia uh, government, but it, it certainly seems in the realm of possibility. And uh, you know, it's interesting to think about is, as you said, Preston, you know, United States has dropped the ball on a number of occasions if they had only seen the value of like the Bitcoin and then and, and crypto assets that they were holding and then auctioning off for relatively little money. Um, perhaps some of these other nations are, are playing a whole different ballgame. All right, y'all. This has been an absolutely fascinating and wide-ranging conversation. I'm afraid that uh, we're hitting our time here. Dan, thanks so much for organizing. And Jameson and Preston, thanks so much for jumping on stage. Um, I guess I just want to close it out with uh, maybe just some last words. Maybe all the panelists can can have a shot at that. Let's start with Preston, go to Jameson, and end with Dan. Yeah, I'm getting a beach house this week, and I'm going to call it Hodel Harbor House. That, that's that's official all right jameson not not much for me other than uh best wishes to those of you living the authoritarian state of canada uh good luck with trudeau <laughs> I'll, I'll boot that i would say uh if you're in canada this is a good good reason to uh, figure out your self-custody solution or to figure out uh, how to run a full node both are pretty easy you know to run a full node you can download the bitcoin core software or you can buy uh hardware software kind of combination like uh, get umbral installed on the physical machine or uh, i believe casa, casa does casa still have the full nose jameson nope I, I forget if casa does but they used to have no nope. no nope. too much trouble right. unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> so yeah do that for running the full node and then you know self custody get yourself uh, like i said before ledger trezor or uh, cold card those are all great solutions um and yeah, that's that's the way that uh, you can protect yourself against the authoritarian state. And thanks for having me on, y'all. Cheers. Cheers. Adios, everyone. Get Bitcoin Magazine. We have a new issue coming out, so keep an eye out for that. Peace.